It's Wednesday, September 9, 2020, just after market close in New York. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington in New York, joined shortly by our managing editor, Ed Harrison. But first, with the day's stories, Peter Cooper. Thanks, Ash. Stocks paired their losses today, with tech leading the recovery. Apple, Amazon, Microsoft combined garnered over $200 billion in market cap. Market cap isn't the only thing Amazon is looking to add. Today, they announced that they are looking to hire over 33,000 new workers. The news comes as Amazon reported record sales and profits last quarter. In other labor market news, the JOLTS report from the Department of Labor revealed that job openings surged to 6.6 million for July, higher than the 6 million that was expected. Hirings, however, did decline to 5.8 million, making a 17% decline from June. Demand for office space is seeing a record slump. I'm looking at Manhattan, where the amount of square footage leased fell off a cliff for the second quarter. According to a report from Seville's, commercial real estate in New York is fully in cost control mode, as tenants are on pandemic pause, waiting for the fog of COVID to recede. And lastly, in macro news, the Bank of Canada is holding the line, today reiterating their pledge to keep their benchmark rate at 0.25%, and announcing they'll leave it unchanged until they hit their inflation target of 2%. Sound familiar? And with that, let's go over to Ash and Ed. Thanks, Peter. Welcome back, Ed. Thank you, Ash. It's good to talk to you. It's good to have you back. Never a slow moment in markets. Uh, no, today. not at all. It's uh, really a good up day in the markets today. Yeah, let's hit the uh, major indices here. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at 27.940, up 1.6% on the day. S&P 500 closed at 33.98, uh, just below the 3,400 level, up 2.01% on the day. NASDAQ up. Uh, 2.71% on the day to close at uh, 11,141. Very nice, actually. Uh, whether it's a trend, uh, we will soon find out. It's hard, to, it's hard to say. Yeah, the only red on my screen right now is the VIX down 7.5% on the day, closing below the 30 level, 29 spot 09. Very nice. Now, you know, let me tell you what I'm thinking about today in that context. I, I want to zoom out a little bit. And actually, the impetus for what I'm talking about is a video that Rao uh, made back in April, uh, April the 8th, to be exact. It was called The Unfolding. It was an expert view that he communicated to us in his role as uh, the head of Global Macro Investor. That's the newsletter that he writes. And he talked to us about a, a grand thesis he had as to how this uh, particular um, market action is going to play out over time. And the two parts, you know, he had a three-part uh, series of events that they played out. We'd already seen the first part. Then we were moving into the second part, what he called the hope phase. And then the question was, when do we move into the third part, what he's called the insolvency phase? And I think that this is a good way to think about, just as we zoom out from what's happening on the day-to-day -day level uh, today, um, you know, wh where we're going and, and, and what sort of framework we can use to get there. Yeah, liquidity, hope, and insolvency. Yeah. And so, I, you know, from my perspective, I think that, you know, there are, I would say, three markers that we could have. Um, the first is the end of the liquidity phase, which was March the 23rd. That's when the Fed stepped in to uh, provide all the liquidity that they provided and they continue to provide even more that caused the markets to zoom up. But interestingly, there was a correction uh, in June, June the 8th to the 11th, around that time frame, where the markets had their first hiccup about 5% down. Um, but then once they had that hiccup, uh, they traded sideways for a little bit for two weeks. And then after June the 26th, they were off to the races before we had this market correction, you know, where the NASDAQ was down 10%. So I think the three markers I would put out are the liquidity phase. I would put out a marker around early June and then a secondary marker uh, here in, in September. And the questions about the June and the September markers are, what do they mean in terms of Rao's overall thesis about uh, hope and insolvency. Yeah. 
And I also have the benefit of having read your uh, credit write downs from Tuesday to get a little bit of color and insight into how you're thinking about that. Uh, and it seems as though you're looking at it and trying to, well, you're you're looking at it in the same time frame that you've been looking at it. You've been remarkably consistent uh, on this September, October, and you're talking about the two potential tracks that it could go on. And let me just read this quote. I see p- two potential outcomes. Either the buy signal gains have been compressed and the volatility today just isn't just a consolidation phase, but a fundamental move down, or we are consolidating and we will be off to the races in due course. So it's almost like you see this as a, the road ahead diverges and which path are we going down? Yeah. And, you know, there are two parts to that. One is that we're at such elevated levels uh, that, you know, either you're going to have a crash down or you're going to continue up in, in a big way, as we've seen already. Uh, I don't think that you know we're going to trade sideways. Uh, but the second is is um, an interview I did with Milton Berg back in um, in August. Actually, I spoke to him in late July, and then we act, and we had the interview in August. And when I talked about uh, you know uh, the buy and the sell signal, really in my mind it was about uh, something that he told me about the June the eighth to, the eighth to the eleventh time frame, because his models were telling him it was a buy signal. Uh, but his intuition was telling him that th- things weren't right. And the way that I've sort of processed it since then is it's about breadth versus a uh, volume. Uh, all of the breadth indicators that he gave me at the time in, in July when we spoke talked about uh, what happened in June. That was the pause, the 5% down move that we did as uh, you know, having good breadth. We, we saw the S&P 500 five-day ups to downs was three to one for the first time since 2014. June yeah. 8th was the sex, sixth time ever in the history of the markets that you had net upside volume as a percentage of the total volume uh, greater than 40%, where uh, January 1987 was the last time that that happened. And then also June the 8th was the second consecutive day when upside volume was nine times downside volume. 9 to 1 on the 7th, 13 to 1 on the 8th. So that's huge breadth, uh, volume breadth, individual name breadth, telling you that you know that's a breakout uh, for the market. Um, and so those were the indicators that he was looking at. But at the same time, he was saying that you know so there's something wrong with the volume indicators because usually in equity markets, what happens is that you have heavy, heavy uh, selling volume. Uh, when you go to the down. But the volume numbers for June were actually greater than the volume numbers for March. So we, we saw volume increasing into uh, what should have been you know, a down signal. So there was something that was happening that, that said breadth uh, signals were one way, and then the volume signals were telling you there's something weird going on. This market isn't acting the, no- the way it normally has. Right. So what do you do, Ed? What's the tie break? How do you weigh that evidence? How do you balance off uh, you know, a, a volume signal telling you one thing and a breath signal telling you something else? You know, for me, the whole time, it's, it's been about the uncertainty, the massive uncertainty from a fundamental perspective of where this economy is going and where earnings are going with that. So that was the piece that I wrote yesterday. It was basically about the fact that I was, I've been saying for quite some time that it's the September, October timeframe when we'll get a lot more clarity on uh, where the economy is headed. Uh, I think that you flagged a, um, a surprise index that, uh, that I saw that was interesting, the, the city surprise index I got from Yardini.com, which yeah. showed that you know over the past a couple of months, uh, the upside surprises have been monumental compared to anything that you see all the way back, uh, you know, a good 10 years. And so uh, to the degree that you think there's going to be a reversion to the mean, that means that we're going to have fewer upside surprises. We're going to also have more certainty in terms of earnings, uh, forecasts. Uh, we're going to have more certainty about the forward look for GDP um, after the initial V-shaped uh, bounce. And then we can take a look and see what uh, what everything looks like as a result of that. So I think that this is a pivotal point in time, September, October, for that reason. And if we could put that, uh, if we could put that chart back up, I'm curious to hear you talk the viewers through what exactly this index means. What is the significance of the way it gyrates, uh, and what does it indicate? 
Yeah, so for me, I'm thinking about uh, just in a generic sense of whether information has been priced in or not. And so, uh, you know, at the margin, uh, what sort of impulse it'll give to the market. So if uh, the uh, Citigroup Economic Surprise Index is, uh, is above zero, the, the more it goes up, the more numbers and just general expectations are being exceeded by the data. And as a result, what it says is, you know, the, it's not all priced in. We can take the markets up further. We can go higher. And yeah. instead, what we see uh, when, uh, you know, it's the opposite is, is, is that uh, it's worse than we thought. Uh, the numbers haven't been priced in. We got to take our estimates lower. We have to take our earnings estimates lower, et cetera. And so we're at very high levels in terms of positive upside surprises. And as you can see from the data from that chart, it's a mean reverting chart. It just oscillates back and forth. So what right. it suggests is, is at some point in the very near future, we're going to mean revert. Uh, that means that there are going to be fewer upside surprises. Uh, to me, that's the toggle that you want to take a look at in terms of whether things are priced in. So to me, this is a... A, a telltale sign of potential volatility, downside risk uh, for the market going ahead and for the economy, obviously, as well. Yeah, very well said. I mean, the, the most striking thing that I see when I look at the chart is that we've never been up this high to the upside surprise before we peaked. It looks like around 270. Uh, and the latest, which is a significant decline, is 186. Uh, and that is still significantly higher than the other highest peak. Uh, which looks like uh, a bounce back where it hit around uh, 100 after the uh, after the Great Recession. Now, you know, I'm not sure how much of this index uh, uh, it comprises anything from asset markets, because obviously if it does, then, you know, you have uh, you have a problem in terms of be being able to use it to say where you're, you are going forward. But I right. do know that uh, generically speaking, it's just telling you the data that you're getting is, is surprising to the upside. And even to the degree that you're taking asset markets uh, into that, we all know that especially at fat tail portions of, the, of uh, the distribution of outcomes in asset markets, that you know what happened two weeks ago or two days ago actually does have some correlation to what happens going forward. That's why you have these massive upswings in these mania parts of the market. And I think that that's the sort of the market that we're in right now. That's why you do see this, this massive downtick and then massive uptick. Yeah. And to your earlier point, you know, about mean reversion, uh, a stylized version of this chart could look a little bit like a, like a sine wave. It's literally just re revolving around the, the zero line on the diffusion index. Exactly. So people, you know, they see the, the data coming in, they correct to, the, to a degree, they overcorrect, and then eventually the data come back in line. Uh, and, and then they have to take the process in the other way, and, and, and it just goes back in that sine wave form that you're talking about. Yeah, and just to put an exclamation point on it, you know, in, in credit write-downs, you say, quote, in short, economic risks remain skewed to the downside, but to the degree economic data prints can continue to meet or exceed expectations, share can consolidate, shares can consolidate and continue their rally. Economic risks have been weighted to the downside for months since the reopening, but the data have outperformed expectations even so wildly, close quote. And yeah, and yeah interestingly enough, if you look at GDP now as an example, uh, Q3 GDP now, even though we've had the uh, you know, we had the reopening and then we had the second wave and people were concerned about the second wave. If you look at the data that's been coming out from the Atlanta Fed or just the macroeconomic data and how uh, the Atlanta Fed turns it into its uh, its uh, now casting model. The now cast is going up. It's gone up considerably over the course of a month and a half. So uh, yeah. the data, they are continuing to uh, to increase. Uh, in terms of the beats, uh, for me, uh, the the big question is is how long can these beats last, and then whether or not, if you do get this mean reversion, can uh, equity markets, can risk markets like junk bonds, uh, for example, uh, can they survive? Uh, can they continue to have uh, up up swings in the face of mean reversion of economic surprises? And my sense is is no, given you know how extended markets have become. Yeah, but we'll just have to take a look and see. Yeah, and for what it's worth, 
The Atlanta Fed uh, GDP now estimate has continued to outstrip the blue chip consensus, uh, which is the range of the top 10 and bottom 10 average forecasts. Right. Now, um, you know, if I could make a, a hard shift to, uh, so, uh, to a different macro view. And remember, yeah. in the background of all this is, is Rao's unfolding. And, and let me just add when I'm talking about this, because we're going to do a content campaign. Uh, the reason that I'm thinking about the unfolding is he's going to give us an update of the unfolding. Uh, in uh, the, It's going to be the first piece that we're going to publish um, in two weeks' time uh, based upon this content campaign that we're doing about where are we right now, what's going on, ha has everything changed? He's going to give his update to, the, uh, to that thesis, and it's been a good five months since we talked to him. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, what's his macro view? Are we in the insolvency phase, et cetera? Now, uh, the second piece that I wrote, which was earlier today, I was it was inspired by something that Jeff Snyder told me when I, I spoke to him on RV Live last week. Uh, he was talking about uh, balance sheets uh, that, you know, about banks being balance sheet constrained. And I, I kind of put it together in my view of what I would call, you know, the cartel, the cartelized system of, of the financial system, endogenous money and then balance sheet constraints and how the, you know, overall the Fed has much less control than they're not omnipotent. They have much less control than you might think that they do. And ultimately uh, what the Fed is doing with quantitative easing is not inflationary. That's the conclusion that I came to. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this is walk, worth walking through in some detail. You really tell the story uh, of how you see uh, endogenous money in the banking system uh, and its relationship to uh, the Fed and the Fed's capacity, or at times lack of capacity, to control the supply of money due to credit creation. Right. You know, I, I look at the Fed as being just another bank. It's, uh, the central bank, you know, way long ago, the central banks, uh, you know, like the Bank of England, they were just the agent of the federal government. They were the, the, the central government's bank. So they're, they're a bank just like any other bank. And what banks do is they create uh, money by uh, creating liabilities. Uh, the Bank of England told us back in 2014, they had a great uh, uh, piece that everyone paid attention to. They said that whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. That's the whole concept of endogenous money. Endogenous money means that money is not created by some external force like the central bank. It's created within the system by all, the, all of the financial institutions. As soon as they say yes, you, Ash Bennington, we're willing to give you a loan. Uh, we'll loan you a hundred thousand dollars. When they deposit that money in your account, they're making a matching uh, asset uh, for the the loan, but then also a liability for the deposit that they they put out. That's creating money. That's what banks do. The difference is uh, between a central bank and a normal bank is that the central bank is creating uh, state money. And the state has the ability to tax you. It has the ability to put you in jail if you don't pay your taxes. It has the ability to tell you that no other money is good in their jurisdiction. And so therefore, that puts the central bank in a much different position. All of the money that the, the central bank is creating is uh, state money. Uh, they can create these IOUs in infinite quantities uh, that you and I need to have to expunge our our, our tax liabilities in order to you know make tr pay for stuff uh, to do transactions in the economy. So that's why the central bank is very different than all the rest of the banks. That's the first part that I would say. You also made a very interesting point about the ability uh, to create uh, infinite amounts of credit it is not limited to the central bank. You talked about during the free banking era how banks could expand uh, credit theoretically inf inf infinitely. Uh, the challenge is getting people to believe that the IOUs are valuable, and that is where the central bank uh, has obviously an outsized role because, as you point out, it's the only legal tender through which we can exp uh, expunge our tax debt. And, and yeah, and so basically, when you, when you have that situation, you have this one bank, the central bank, uh, which has this huge benefit because of legal tender laws, because of uh, the ability to tax uh, and right. so forth. 
uh, it has uh, the ability, therefore, to say, you know what, uh, we'll be the central bank and, and we will cartelize uh, the banking system. We will allow you to uh, uh, allow people to withdraw money from your institution, you know, take on your liabilities and treat them as if they're our liabilities, you know, state right. money. Uh, so when you go to the bank account, you withdraw your AT from the ATM, you're withdrawing state money. You're not withdrawing money from, you know, Chase banknotes or, uh, you know, um, uh, Bank of America ba uh, banknotes. You were talking about the free banking period. They created their own banknotes back then. I mean, if you went to the ATM, you would be getting JP Morgan uh, banknotes. And and those are as good as they, however good they are. They're better or worse than Bank of America banknotes or Wachovia banknotes, whatever it might right. be. So the the point is, is that the, the Fed says, or the central bank says, look, you know, you can do that. I'll give you, I'll let you, uh, you know, give out state money, but you got to do what I, I say. You, you got to hold money in reserve and you have right. to submit yourself to our control, our regulation. And if you do that, then you're, you're free to continue to create liabilities uh, as you see fit. But of course, if you lend recklessly, we'll just take your license away from you. So that's the cartel at the, right. the heart of the financial system. Right. And it's also, you know, many would argue to the advantage of, of citizens to have a single, uh, to have state money because you know that the value isn't going to crash if JP Morgan or Wachovia, uh, you know, experiences insolvency. The value of the money issued by the state bank retains its value because it's backed by, as we as we said earlier, uh, the ability uh, as the as legal tender to be the form that you of uh, money that you expunge your debts and tax liabilities. And you know that's the interesting bit about uh, uh, about bank runs is is that you know uh, it, during a bank run that's when you realize that actually J P Morgan isn't giving you state money mm -hmm. until you get the money from them. The, the transformation, right. the magical transformation from a J.P. Morgan liability into uh, a government liability only happens when you show up at the window and you demand your money back. If everyone demands their money back at the same time, the, the bank will, you know, they can't create infinite amounts of state money IOUs. They'll go insolvent. So when the bank run happens, you want to make sure that you get your state money first before everyone else does, because that's the money that's legal tender. That's how you can uh, expunge your tax liabilities. That's the safest asset uh, within uh, the domain of, of, uh, of the central bank. Yeah. And of course, another innovation uh, is, is FDIC. So you have deposit insurance. Uh, you're insured in the event of insolvency up to $250,000. I believe the number is now per individual, 500000 I guess, per couple. Uh, so if it, your local bank becomes insolvent, you have a backstop in the form of FDIC. And, you know, the, all of this is important because what it says is, I mean, if we go back to the whole endogenous money thing about uh, these banks being, you know, they're they're safe because of FDIC and because they're regulated and so forth. They're out there making, they're creating money. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's in, when we say endogenous money, they're creating loans. Uh, and the only thing that's keeping them from creating uh, loans out the yin yang is regulation and, and their own self regulation about, you know, the potential insolvency. They want to make a profit. They want to lend to credit worthy borrowers who are going to pay them back and, and make money off of that. And, and that's how they expand their equity base and are able to distribute dividends and continue to be a functioning and, and, and profitable organization. So, um, you know, where that all becomes stuffed up, obviously, is when you have a situation like right now, right. where, uh, you know, people don't have incomes, uh, where businesses don't have incomes. And as a result of that, everyone is just like, not only do I not want to lend money as a financial institution, I, I as a, uh, a business or a household, I don't want to actually take on money. Right. So even though the central bank might be buying assets like crazy, you know, buying uh, uh, um, commercial, um, commercial loans, uh, you know, commercial bonds, they might be buying mortgage-backed securities, they might be buying uh, treasury bonds they are not able to induce uh, all the people in the private sector to take on debt or to, uh, or to um, you know, give out debt to uh, borrowers. And so 
that's where we are now. Quantitative easing, there's no direct line between quantitative easing and the financial economy, the endogenous money economy that's run in the private sector. Yeah, exactly. And here's the key quote, why this matters. Quote, the crucial issue in all of this is that there is no direct line from large-scale asset purchases by central banks, aka quantitative easing, to money growth. What if banks see bad assets on their balance sheet and stop making loans to protect their balance sheets? What if companies and households are so indebted already that they aren't willing to risk taking on more debt in a poor economy? In both those cases, quantitative easing won't matter. It might displace investors from the treasury market and push them out the risk curve into equities or junk bonds, but it's not going to make financial institutions lend, and it's not going to make businesses and households borrow. Close quote, Ed Harrison. There's the point. If you're not able uh, to induce that borrowing, the real economy can continue to stagnate. Right. And, you know, you, we talked about this whole two price system, the Hyman Minsky thing. I think we talked about that yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A, a, a week ago or two. Uh, and basically, that's what you're seeing there is, is, is that, yes, you can displace uh, some of the investors and get them to bid up asset prices. That's a completely different system than uh, the the system of um, cost plus pricing that you see in consumer goods and services. So right. there's you know there's massive overcapacity right now in the United States and around the world in those uh, goods and services markets. And so there's no inflation happening there. And the Fed can do whatever they want. They're not going to c cause inflation unless they you know credit people's accounts directly. You have to put money in people's pockets. And, and so that they can actually, uh, you know, have demand for goods and services. If they don't have the money, then they're, they're not going to be able to bid up those prices. So all the people who are talking about inflation, I, I don't see it. I have no, you know, I, I see asset price inflation. That's I right. do not see consumer price inflation uh, for the foreseeable future. So for me, again, it, it points to a curve flattening. Uh, it, it points to the curve remaining low. Um, it points to interest rates remaining low. And uh, and, and that's going to be how it is for the foreseeable future until, uh, you know, more people have more money. Yeah. Lower for longer, flatter curve. And uh, the idea that there is, as we've talked about time and time again, a clear divide between the financial economy in the form of risk asset prices and the real economy, uh, which is about production, consumption, and supply and demand of physical assets and services. So, you know, if I could take this back to the first uh, thing that we were talking about, like the here and now and then Rao's unfolding, what I would say is that, so we're at this pivotal moment in September, October, where th that whole confluence of events is coming together uh, because, we, yes, we've, out we've outperformed, but some of the real, um, uh, you know, real-time data that I see are telling me that, you know, we're going to continue to see more jobless claims uh, we're not going to see any sort of economic impulse from the government. We're going to see all of these uh, the census workers drop out of the labor force or you know become unemployed very shortly. So very shortly, things are going to get a lot more difficult. That mean reversion is going to happen. Uh, and then we are going to have to see whether or not because of the endogenous money uh, credit system that we live in, whether or not that's going to negatively impact uh, the economy. I think it will, but I'm open to the concept that uh, you know we can power through this. Yeah. Once again, and right to the heart of the issue. Thank you. I appreciate that. Always a pleasure.